Welcome back for part two of the series Andrew Tate, Matrix of Lies. In part one, we covered claims made about Tate's early life, then went through his questionable kickboxing championship record and career, and ended off with the controversy that ended his stint on Big Brother. This segment is going to move forward from that point to focus on the mythos surrounding Andrew and Tristan Tate and their social media empire they now flaunt across multiple platforms. At one point, when saner minds prevailed, the Tates were actually banned across most mainstream social media. Andrew Tate's primary Twitter account, at of Wudan, that's another story we'll get into, got kicked off Twitter in 2017 after criticizing the Me Too movement, telling victims they bore some responsibility for getting raped and abused. Further, he posted how the movement was actually harming women and was destroying the safety of men. Not surprisingly, at that very moment in time, Tate had been charged with and was being investigated for a 2015 rape incident in the UK. The audio voicemail recording we used in part one, detailing how he strangled her, was part of the evidence against Tate. Other reprehensible acts committed against the victim were also part of the evidence kit, including text that read, I loved raping you. However, after a four-year investigation into the incident, the UK authorities declined to prosecute Tate, who had fled to Romania in the meantime while he was under investigation. In short, the UK authorities in 2015 had the opportunity to stop Tate, and they completely dropped the ball by not only allowing him to skate on these charges, which seemed to embolden him, but also by allowing him to move his operation to Romania. Here's Tate telling his fans why he made that move. This is probably 40% of the reason I moved to Romania, because in Eastern Europe, none of this garbage flies. If you're going to go to the police and say he raped me back in 1988, you're going to say we should have done something about it then. If you're going to the police and say he raped me yesterday, you say, okay, have you got physical evidence? Or is there CCTV proof? Where'd it happen? Okay, let's go interview him right now. And if it wasn't really right, oh, I'd say, oh, we went to the club, we got drunk, she agreed to go back to my house, we started having sex, and then we carried on having sex, and then we had sex, and she didn't say anything wrong, and then she texted me afterwards, and I didn't text back, and now she's saying I raped her. The police would be like, okay, she's an idiot, bye. But they, no, not in the West. In the West, you can tell them that exact story, you're still fucked. You're fucked in the West. When people say, why did you in Romania? And I explain my five reasons. One of them is the Me Too era. They go, oh, well, you're a rapist. I say, no, I'm not a fucking rapist. But I like the idea of being able to just say, to do what I want. I like being free. And if you're a man living in England or Germany or America or any of the Western world right now, you've decided to live in a country where any woman, any ex, any fucking bitch who works at Greg's who you bought a pasty from, at some point in the future can destroy your life. This Me Too era bullshit has not protected women. It's just destroyed the safety of men. But we're getting ahead of ourselves again, so back to the main point we were making. Tate was banned across the big five social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. To give some context here, Tate wasn't really on people's radar at the time. So his banishment from social media only seems to be mentioned now by mainstream media in retrospect in stories announcing that Tate was reinstated on Twitter in November of 2022. You get one guess which asshole we have to thank for that. And after the reinstatement happened, the floodgates of Tate's speech were opened wide. To give you an idea how much these two brothers in crime love to hear the sound of their own voices and the degree to which they are now using social media to spread their message du jour, here's a sampling of just the Twitter accounts the Tate's controlled directly, complete with in-profile links to CobraTate.com, seemingly the largest of their websites. Andrew Tate's primary account now is at CobraTate. At Tate News underscore is the one retweeted by the Tate brothers. It regurgitates everything they post. Then there's at Tate War Plans, at Young Kings Grow, at Uncorrupted Men, at Tate Pledge, at The Real World AI, at HU4 underscore official, at The White Rabbit, at Discover TRW, at Emergency Tate, at Reach TWR, at The War Room TWR, at Masterful Poe, at HU underscore The Real World, at Andrea the Cobra is most likely an alt account, at Morpheus Resist, and at Morpheus Central. Since Tate started blaming The Matrix for all of his current legal problems, saying he's now been attacked by The Matrix, he started fancying himself as a Morpheus figure and had his animators do up a bunch of vanity clips featuring him that looks like this to impress his prepubescent boy followers. Fact of the matter is, Tate doesn't resemble Morpheus in the slightest. Morpheus was a quiet leader who built others up, never degraded them, 
never thought of himself as exceptional, and the women on his crew were competent warriors who shared equal standing with their male counterparts. Tate is far more like a cipher character, an underhanded wannabe. I want to be rich. You know, someone important. Like an actor. Whatever you want. A self-concerned narcissist who didn't care who he hurt in order to achieve his own selfish goals. I don't believe it. <clears throat> believe it or not, you piece of shit, you're still gonna burn. <laughs> <sighs> In addition to the other Twitter profiles, Tristan Tate has four of his own. The one that was suspended, at Lives Talisman, also at Tate the Talisman, at Talisman Management, and at Talisman underscore Tate. And in true digital narcissistic fashion, the brothers' dozens of Twitter profiles point to more than a dozen vanity and subscription websites. CobraTate.com, FreeTate.com, Warplans.ag, which now directs back to CobraTate.com, HusslersUniversity.ag, TheWarRoom.ag, JoinTheRealWorld.com, TatePledge.com, their BS charity website, EscapeWhileYouCan.com, connected to Morpheus Central's Twitter account, JoinTRWGlobal.com, DiscoverTRW.com, and TopG.com. Between their Rumble and their YouTube accounts, almost every move the Tate brothers make is video documented. Their main YouTube channels are Tate Stories and Tate Confidential. On Rumble, their primary account is Tate Speech by Andrew Tate. And of course, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other accounts that rebroadcast the content that Tate's put out. This is a remnant of what was called their affiliate program, which is how the Tate influence grew even while they were banned on social media. Subscribers and fanboys could earn credits towards memberships in the various Tate programs by also getting their friends to sign up, which is why there are so many accounts that parrot every word of advice that Tates regurgitate. Now would probably be a good time to introduce the head weasel in the goal to document every single second of the Tates' collective lives in slow motion. This is Bailey Bolton, a very meek fellow who fell in love with Andrew Tate to the point where Bolton reached out to Tate and offered to fly himself to anywhere in the world Tate wanted to work for him for free. So when your social media feed is flooded with Tate strutting around shirtless and punching people that don't punch back and smoking cigars while regurgitating useless self-help nonsense, remember to curse this particular asshat as well. Okay, so from here we're going to take information from these social accounts, news articles, and any other source we can find to dissect how Tate devolved into the sexual predator that he is today, and we're mainly going to use his own words. We'll be using video clips from the non-stop interviews he does and podcast he puts out, hours of material every day, so it's honestly very hard to keep up with Tate's speech. And seriously, just the fact that their Rumble channel is a playoff of hate speech, that kind of tells you what we're in for here. Some of the interviews and videos are from early on in Tate's historical record, overlapping earlier material, and some are from very recently. In order for you to have a rough idea when these videos are from, is going by Andy's appearance. Observing his receding hair and scruffy beard make it fairly easy to track him over time on his interviews. Until he shaved his head on camera a couple of weeks back to summon the top G, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. And of course, if you see pictures of him enjoying the high life on jets or yachts that he's so famous for showing off, those are definitely all pre-arrest December 2022. In his recent library of house arrest videos, you can see he's become quite buff, probably more so than when he was fighting for money, leading to reasonable accusations of steroid use. He definitely wants everyone to see how big he is right now, hardly ever wearing a shirt these days. Maybe he's preening for the Romanian convicts that are waiting on him to join general population again. And when you're not admiring Andrew's pecs in his videos, he's taking pictures of himself admiring himself in the mirror the truest form of narcissism a person can express. In this case, wearing American flag boxers, so people who didn't see this clip think that he is still a proud American. I also want to give a very special thanks to Romania and the Romanian people. The number of Romanian people who send me messages of support is absolutely fantastic. This is my home, I love this country, I'm gonna stay here regardless, no matter what. From all the Andrew Tate interviews and monologues we've listened to, we've done our best to distill how Andrew Tate got to where he is today. And it turns out there is a very linear progression. As we mentioned in part one, Andrew Tate was a half-decent kickboxer in his day, padding his record, 
among a small field of competitors. When those paychecks started coming in, the former poor boy obviously enjoyed living the high life and being the big man flaunting his newfound minor wealth. But those paychecks stopped coming in and they weren't that big to begin with. As he says in later interviews, some of the fights were only worth six to $7,000 per fight. Tate mentioned in another interview that his highest purse for a fight was around $100,000. When Tate concluded that kickboxing was not going to pay for his desired lavish lifestyle, he turned to drug trafficking in his adopted hometown of Luton, England. Here's him telling you that. So when I was 24, 25, I sold drugs. Long time ago now. I can be honest and open about my past. I was a fighter, but fighting wasn't paying the bills, sold drugs, whatever. So I'm selling drugs. I didn't really like selling drugs. I didn't like the anxiety. I didn't like the idea of getting caught. I didn't like the, the violence, the stabbing. Tate has claimed in interviews that he made his first million dollars by the age of 27, which would be sometime during 2014, perhaps as a result of his win over Wendell Roche, a kickboxer with only two kickboxing victories between October 15th of 2011 and his retirement fight July 21st of 2019. Not exactly an impressive opponent. Let's say Tate's purse for that fight was the $100,000 paycheck that he mentioned. Where do you think the other $900,000 came from to give Tate a million bucks? Then Tate upped his claim, saying that four years later, so by 2018, he was worth $100 million. So I was, I was broke for a long time. I made my first million when I was, say, 27. And then I had 100 million by the time I was 31, Holy 32. Fuck. Long after he effectively retired from the kickboxing arena, the three fights he had in 2020 in Romania were unlikely to affect that total significantly. And if that was the case, why would a guy worth $100 million by the time he turned 31 be fighting Romanian scrubs for pennies in 2020? But Tate wasn't quite done making ridiculous exaggerations about his wealth. I had 100 million by the time I was 31, Holy 32. Fuck. And then I became a trillionaire quite recently. Trillionaire meaning a um, thousand billion. Correct. Trillionaire, Tr the world's first trillionaire. It's pretty obvious that Tate had no concept what a trillionaire is. So the tabloids not asleep at the wheel on this guy took some piss out of him for making that claim. Still, the guy has to have some money behind him while he's trying to convince people he lives full time in a Rick Ross rap video. Oh, I'm about to shoot a movie using all the same hoes. Bouncing through the college for the campus hoes. Promise I'm a scholar, always gotta sample those. So where did the Tate money come from? According to Andrew Tate, after fighting failed to deliver the windfall he needed to support his lifestyle, he took the money he made in the drug trade and used it to franchise several casino locations in Bucharest through the Romanian mob after being a drug dealer in England was making him too anxious and paranoid. Apparently, it also got him stabbed because Tate wound up owing his drug dealer 2,500 pounds. Tate says this about the attack. And then about four days later, I was walking to my car in a car park late at night. Typical English weather. It was a little bit wet, dark, and I heard footsteps coming fast. And as I turned to see what the footsteps was, he attempted to stab me. And that's why anyone who knows me well knows that my finger basically came off where I put the hand, took the knife instead of my neck. Now, balance that fact against this monologue, which is completely unrelated. I know a lot about dealing drugs. I'm not going to say I previously dealt drugs, but let's just say I know a lot about dealing drugs. And the yeah. problem with dealing drugs is as follows. Let's say you have 20 keys. Let's say for each kilo you move, you make 10 Gs, right? So that's 200 grand. Let's say in one, but let's say that's 200 grand, right? But let's say the kilo of Coke costs you 100, right? So it costs you 100, you sell it for 110. 20 kilos, you make 200 grand in a month. One month, everything goes smooth, everything goes well, fine. The month afterwards, there's a there's a police bus. One of your runners gets caught, gets arrested, or they stop the car, or you get robbed, which is a big problem with drug dealers yep. because you can't go to the police, and you lose two kilo. Now you have now you've lost all of your profit from the last month, all right? Of all of it. Or you have to sell every single kilo you have left for free just to pay off the debt to the guy above you. Mr. Big Shot talking about hypothetically making 10 grand a key when actually he had an enforcer put a knife through his hand over a 2,500 pound debt while the attacker attempted to do Tate even more harm. So yeah, why not get into bed with the mafia in casinos after your drug dealer has tried to take you out for your drug debt? Makes total sense. And here's what Tate told Tom and Christina from YouTube's Your Mom's House channel about his casino mob connections. 
how how do you generate your income? The first thing is I own some casinos in Romania. There was a guy who owns 400 casinos, three brothers, mafia guys, they own 400 casinos throughout Eastern Europe. Eventually I came up with a plan and I said, look, how about this? I'll open up your locations directly next to your biggest competitor. Worst case, the location doesn't pay any money, but at least it takes money from your competitor. I'll give you a percentage of turnover, so even if it doesn't make profit, you make money. I'll take all the financial risk. They agreed, I started opening up next to their biggest competitor. I actually did something that was kind of funny. What I tried to do was find ones in between their competitor and a Starbucks. I'd open in the middle and then I'd offer loads and loads of free coffee with a barista and a sexy chick. So instead of going to Starbucks, you could just take your money and go get free coffee and gamble. And here's what Tate was saying about himself back in the early days. This is why I think I have a bit of a following on Twitter because I have a unique, I have a unique resume. Like there's a whole bunch of guys on Twitter, but not many like world champion kickboxer, pimp, mafia associated criminal. Like I've got all this stuff and it was like, who is this dude? Like surely it can't all be true. I'm like, it's all true. The Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, an international network of independent media centers intent on exposing crime and corruption so the public can hold power to account tackled the claims made by the Tate brothers about their Mafia Casino affiliation. Here's how their investigation was conducted and what it reported, in Romanian, so we'll read the subtitles aloud for you. So Andrew Tate says he owns casinos in Romania, but Tate is someone who kind of exaggerates. So far there is no definitive proof that the Tates are active in the Romanian gambling market. Moreover, certainly not in association with the Mafia. So we set out to see if it is true. When we found out the Tates were arrested for human trafficking and rape, we searched the internet for everything about them. Then we searched their full names in the official gazette and filed a petition at the National Commercial Registry. That's how we found the Tates companies in Romania, including a company called Talisman Enterprises. The documents had some peculiar addresses in Bucharest without other details. When we pulled them up on Google Maps, most seemed like random buildings. The Tates had signed contracts with other companies that owned casinos. Those mysterious addresses were, in fact, casinos. It was surprising because it was true. The Tates make money from at least four casinos in Bucharest. They are called Las Vegas. We want to see what they look like. We're in one of the poorer zones of Bucharest, where there aren't rich gamblers, and the people come here to gamble their minimum wage or pension. Obviously, this is not a fancy casino. I don't see how this matches Top G's Andrew Tate's depiction. So who are the Tate brothers business partners? Are they really the Mafia? And would the Tates really brag that they partnered with the Mafia? Would they tip off everyone? We started digging into them. The documents we obtained are joint venture contracts between one of Tate brothers companies, Talisman Enterprises, and a company called DMS Bet Live. They split the profits 50-50. The name apparently stands for the owners the Dorofte brothers, Mahaisha and Soren. The Dorofte brothers are mostly known for being the founders of the Romanian mixed martial arts brand RXF. They organize cage fights. These events are typically sponsored by their casinos, Las Vegas. The big brother, Mahaisha Dorofte, is almost invisible on social media, but we were able to find a few photos of him from many years ago on the social media accounts of those close to him. Then we started to find their family scattered across social media, meaning their friends, partners, associates. And the DMS crew is also made up of several people who have the initials tattooed on their bodies. I'm going to stop here. He says Mahaicha the Pole. This is really important. We discovered that although he was born in Romania, Mahaicha Dorofte also has Polish citizenship. We dug into old court files and discovered this transcript of a wiretapped meeting between a drug trafficker and his lieutenants. It says that in 2019, a Polish investor brought together several mafia clans from all over Romania to launch a casino business together. He wanted to open casinos throughout the major cities in Romania and become the main player. Off the record, a law enforcement source confirmed this wiretap is about the Las Vegas casinos. But it gets even more interesting. Just before the Tates were arrested on charges of human trafficking and rape, Police raided what prosecutors say is an organized crime group behind the Las Vegas casinos. They raided over 120 people and companies involved in a case of organized crime. According to prosecutors, most of these mobsters were fictitiously hired by the casinos as tech guys to repair the slot machines, but really they were hired to provide muscle. They hostilely took over the competition's casinos and beat up people who won jackpots at the Las Vegas casinos in order to return the money. 
The two Dorofte brothers were charged with being part of an organized crime group in November 2022. And recently, Mahajda Dorofte officially became a wanted man in Romania. They issued an arrest warrant for him. He is wanted as the leader of the organized crime group. So yes, the Tates are in the casino business in Romania. And yes, the Tates are in business with organized crime. Moving into casinos certainly didn't make Tate rich, but it did make him a target for corrupt officials looking for free bribe money. Romania is completely corrupt from head to toe, right? So I have a very, very extensive network in Romania. I, I like to make this very clear. One of the reasons I love living there so much is because I'm at the very top echelon of society. If I need to speak to the prime minister, I can make that happen. So we went and met with some members of parliament and they're like, well, it's not us, it's European Union directed all of this COVID lockdown garbage. You can open them if you don't put the outside lights on and you just like on the sly. So I did a deal with them to open them on the sly and pay bribes. So for I was open for like the first month with bribes, but the bribe kept going up because it's Romania, right? The police chief would come, he wants some, and the police chief would call his mate, who's the fucking, I don't know, fire inspector, some jackass, he'd come. Then the alcohol licensing man would come. It was just like, everyone's got on the phone like, hey, this casino's still open. They'll pay you to go away. So before you know it, every five minutes, someone's in the door for money. And we weren't making money, so we had to close down. So we've been closed until, we're still closed to this day. We're still waiting to be reopened. And uh, nobody feels sorry for the casino owner. It's, it's kind of hard to play the pity card. My business has gone under. Everyone's like, who gives a shit? Fuck you. Now, if we can catch a contradiction here in this little clip, Tate says he's got an extensive network of corruption available to him in Romania. He's top echelon of society, he says. If Tate needs to talk to the prime minister, he can make that happen. Or at least he could with the last guy. Maybe that's why Nikolai Kuka got voted out a month ago and replaced with this guy. But if Andrew Tate really was top echelon of society, do you honestly think he'd have to pay bribes to keep his doors open? Or is it far more likely that Tate has exaggerated his status here as someone who had to pay the top echelon to stay in business? It would appear that Tate is a small fish, talking like he's the big shark. Now the reason why we have gone into this amount of detail on this topic is that despite the Dorothees claiming they have broken all business ties with the Tates, both Andrew and Tristan have reportedly been recorded in wiretap surveillance as having admitted to being involved with money laundering operations. The wiretap quote reads, You're not stupid and you can probably guess how I make so much money. I have to hide what I'm really doing. I've been doing this for a long time with a team of girls working on video chat. The company was fake, but this is how I laundered my dirty money. Some of the girls who worked for me, I used them to do other things, to move money or illegal things, documents, etc. The audio recording is quite damning, and we're going to circle back to this when we start going over the legal battles the Tates face. But this segues nicely into the Tate brothers' webcam origin story, and as it turns out, it was Tristan who had already found money in the webcam game before Andrew clued into it. Yeah. My, so my brother comes along and says, listen, you're making a little bit of money. We're gonna change it up. You're gonna listen to me. I'm gonna install some structure and some discipline in your fucking life. Yeah. And you're gonna make some real money. And I'm gonna get a percentage. So my brother runs an OnlyFans agency. My brother's making 200 grand a month from OnlyFans. Casino's making more than that. Little brother Tristan had already been managing webcam girls through an agency called Talus Management, a play off of Tristan's kickboxing nickname, Tate the Talisman. Talus Management still has a Twitter profile, showing everyone the various models that lonely incels could buy subscriptions to on OnlyFans. That lineup of models includes the mother of Tristan Tate's daughter, going by the moniker Abigail Tyson with three N's. The fact that she is still active in this online profile game while raising Tristan's daughter tells you loads about the kind of man that Tristan Tate is not. I had to uh, downgrade one of the mothers of my kids from the house she was living in. I needed her to understand that you do not fuck with me. And she was living in a four bedroom rented house and I was paying the rent and all the bills and I pay everything. I said, okay, you know what? You wanna fuck with me in that way? That's cool. You have 30 days to get out of that house. Here's your new apartment, two bedrooms. Well, well, what do you mean? Now, now, now your uh, uh, child doesn't have a garden to play in. Well, that's your fault. That is not my fault. Take her to the fucking park. I don't take shit. So it's never gonna get to that level where they think, oh, well, let me call the US embassy and because he's a citizen, maybe I can, because they know, they know the consequence. It's not gonna turn out good for them or me or anybody. As declared autobiographically, Andrew decided that he was going to take the four girlfriends he had at the time and get them set up in their own webcam studio. Let's get him to tell you the story from the beginning. 
long story short, I invested in this place in Thailand, this property, which I still have now, which is not worth anything because of this virus and they closed the country, blah, blah, blah. And I needed to pay, I think it was like 400 grand and I had a payment date and I paid 300 grand and I was, I had to pay the last hundred grand. I only had 70 grand. I was 30 grand short, right? And I thought, I said to Tristan, I said, you know what? When's the last time I got lucky, lucky? And he's like, don't do it. It's like, bro, don't trust the big G. I'm going to go to the casino with this 70. I'm going to turn it into a hundred. So I went to the casino and lost all the money. I had some friends so I could hit up for a hundred grand. So I hit them up, but these are guys you have to pay back, right? So I pay the, I make the payment, blah, blah, blah. And then I needed money fast. Technically you needed a hundred grand. Yeah, well, exactly. I needed, <laughs> I needed 150. So that's one version of the story, but that story constantly changes. Yeah, so I, I, I did a deal with some Albanians and I needed some money. We won't go into details. I needed some money pronto. So I'm sitting there and I had a fight coming up, but the fight was too far away for money and I needed money today. So I'm sitting there thinking, how can I make money? What do I have that's worth money? Like, what do I have that I can even sell? And I was sitting there and the only thing I had was all these girlfriends. So the beginning of it was I messaged my six girlfriends and told them they're all coming to live with me and I had a job for them in London. Uh, two of them wouldn't come, four of them agreed. So the four girls flew in, I sat them all down at a table. They're all like, who's this chick? Who's this chick? Told them all the truth. I've been with you all. I'm starting a webcam business. I'm gonna get rich. Some of you are gonna come with me to the top of the mountain or if you're pissed off, you can fucking fly home. Which is very matter of fact to the point because I needed money at this point. Now I have not agreed to take another fight. I need money now. So uh, two of them left, two of them agreed to stay. And the beginning of my cam empire was this tiny little apartment, me and my two girlfriends living in this house, right? Normally people are a little more consistent in their origin story, but regardless of the actual details, there's one common thread here. And that is Andrew Tate needed to make a bunch of money and webcams are where the Tates finally started seeing some serious money come their way. Not by fighting, not by selling drugs, not through the mob casinos. No, by sexually exploiting their own girlfriends online. And by the time Tate appeared on Big Brother, this webcam business was already up and running. When the money started coming in, it wasn't good enough for Tate to split the proceeds with the girls on camera 50-50. No, he had to screw them over even further by lying to them about their earnings, which he justified by calling women lazy and stupid. When the brothers started racking up the dollars, literally off the back of the girls working for them, Andrew saw another opportunity to cash in on this by selling the paradigm he used to get started in the webcam racket to the same audience of sexually frustrated men that were already paying Tate's ex-girlfriends huge tips so they could watch the half-naked girls take vodka shots and dry hump each other. Now, just in case there's anyone who thinks we're making this stuff up or we're taking it out of context, we found the full version of Tate's earliest webcam instructional video that he used to sell online. It's an hour long video, but for this episode, we cut the content down to five minutes flat. The Coles Notes version of Andrew Tate's How to Be an Online Pimp tutorial. This was Tate's PhD program, short for Pimping Hose Degree, which he thought was clever. It's Tate describing in detail exactly how to find girls, recruit them into doing webcam, and then how to control their money and actions so they can't leave. As we said at the outset, there is no sugarcoating this topic. So this is exactly what advice Tate sells to other men, according to Tate. Just remember as you're watching this, many people paid money for this garbage, and some basement dwellers mistakenly adopted this dribble as gospel for how to start up their own online porn studios. You're effectively taking girls, teaching them how to make unlimited money from home, and then making sure they give it all to you. You need a webcam and you need MacBooks. You need a girl who's prepared to work with some pussy and titties. You want everyone to believe it's a girl in her bedroom at home on her own. There are only two webcam websites worth fucking with. The first one is Live Yasmin. It's girls who work for studios, it's professional girls. The website you are going to use is Chatterbait. Chatterbait is how you're gonna get rich because you, they will pay you in Bitcoin. No fucking tax, none of that shit. So don't worry about any of that. None of that's gonna come back to get you. Your goal is to inspire a girl to make money and give you the money. You have to have some element of influence, believing she needs you. Because at the beginning she will need you, but you have to keep that fallacy, keep that dream alive that she can't do this without you. When a girl is on camera, she has a public room to make the maximum money. It is your job to train the girl, to talk to and interact with that public room, 
She can also receive private messages. And guys are gonna privately message her before they wanna spend money. The girl's responsibility is to worry about the room and all those private messages you are gonna to reply to and pretend to be the girl. She will go like this on her laptop and pretend to type and you will actually reply to all the guys. It makes the girl believe that she can't do it without you. Pimp, positively inspirational and motivating person. Now, what do you say to the men when you're typing to them in private messages? The men want attention and you only give them attention if you get what you want, which is money. So you have to be careful when you're talking to these guys not to give too much attention to men who don't tip. What I do, or when I, when I used to type, is I'd be quite upfront about what I want. I'd say, oh, you're beautiful. I'd say, oh, thank you. Get my Snapchat then. It's, I'm more horny on Snapchat. These are all things you can sell. What I did is I put a girl online, I'd have a countdown. I'd say a uh, thousand tokens till topless, for example. She's sitting there with a skimpy top on. Everyone wants to see her titties. When she gets to a thousand tokens, the top comes off. 110 tokens for a shower video. I just say, go to the shower, get your phone, make a two minute thing while you're in the shower. You sell that video on and on for years. If you sell a WhatsApp, I used to sell a WhatsApp for about 3,000 tokens, about 150 bucks. And I had a separate phone with all my girls' guys in that phone and I kept control of it. You don't let your girl have this because if your girl ever runs off and leaves you, you don't want her to have an address book of all the guys she can get money from. You want her to leave and go, well, I don't know the account. I don't have the password to the account. I've never set it up before. I don't know how the banking works. I don't have any of my guys' phone numbers. I have nothing. And that's why they don't want to leave because they're like, oh, well, he has everything. I need him. I have to stay with him. He has everything. I'm telling you, it's a very important element, that control. Because once the money starts pouring in, the girls will be like, well, what the fuck do I need this dude for? Tax is also another important element for controlling your woman. You're not going to pay anybody tax because you're getting paid in Bitcoin. But you need to tell your girl that you're paying the tax. Because girls are lazy, and girls are stupid, and girls don't understand how taxes work. She'll sit there and go, okay, okay. Now that allows you to do two things. One, it's another control element. Secondly, it allows you to pay her a smaller percentage. So I used to pay my girls 30%. They thought they were on 50%. So really you're paying 30, you tell them you're paying 50. The difference is in the tax. The girl you start with is gonna be your bottom bitch. The bottom bitch is the girl who collects the money from all the other girls and brings you the money. You cannot get a girl to work for you, you haven't fucked. The PhD course is my recruitment system. You message them on Instagram. I don't mention webcam until after I've had sex with the girl. After you fuck the girl, you do the PhD test. If she passes the PhD test and she wants to be with you, then you start mentioning things like, yeah, but you know, you're always busy. You're always at work. You can come work for me. Work for you doing what? So I'll have a webcam business. Oh, I don't want to do that. So, okay, I know you don't want to do that, but let me explain it to you properly. In fact, I'll bring one of the girls who works for me. Your bottom bitch is the one who does the selling. You don't do the selling. My girl would sit there and go, oh my God, before this I was a waitress and it was shit and now I do this and I make so much money and the guys all love me and they adore me and on my birthday they send me presents. Martinis, 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 bang, threesome. Slam them both. Your bottom bitch knows. This girl's like, okay, well I'll try it. Put both girls on camera together the first day. Give them a bottle of vodka. Put on the fucking chatterbait. Uh, 100 tokens per shot. The guys will send loads of money to get the girls drunk because guys like drunk girls. Girls will sit there, get drunk, have a great time. You say, it's your new job now. You haven't go to work ever again. That's how you recruit girls. You do not recruit girls any other way. Get it started. And if you have any further questions, come at me. I'm going to do a second video. So all you chatterbaiters out there who used to lube up their tube sock before tipping these exploited girls to watch them strip, just remember... This is the girl who was actually responding to all of your private messages and every WhatsApp message you ever sent them. The half-naked girl in the video never knew your name. One other thing before we go any further. Remember this lady, the one who publicly exonerated Tate from the beating video that got him kicked off Big Brother? Meet Vivian, also known as Cobra Baby with three Ys. Vivian was Andrew Tate's bottom bitch, his recruiter, his groomer, for at least six years, according to this video, where Tate let slip a couple other pieces of information. And I only get away with that because the girl of six years plays along. So Vivian's been with me six years. She's completely head over heels in love with me. She wants kids with me, everything, everything, everything. And we met and we fell, whatever, we're in love. But when a new girl comes, she'll go, oh yeah, I started off working for him and you know, it's just how it worked out. She'll super downplay us. When I bring on new girls, I usually pair them with Vivian. Because Vivian's younger. Melissa's like 28, Vivian's like 21. Vivian's younger, she's more fun, more outgoing. Melissa's really quite, not in a bad way, she's more homey. 
If you were paying attention to this video, you picked up a couple of things. The first is that Vivian was 21 when this video was recorded, and she had been working with Tate for six years. So this 15-year-old was one of the four girls that Tate called together to start up his racket, and obviously was the only one of the four that stayed with him. Another thing you may have picked up was that most of the new girls were partnered with Vivian to get them going. In Epstein terms, Vivian is Andrew's Ghislaine Maxwell, and we all know where she wound up. Which is why it was in Cobra Baby's best interest to come out in defense of Andrew after that video got leaked. Because if Vivian had been questioned about this and told them she was a victim of Tate, which is more likely the truth given the way Tate smacked her around, her involvement as a recruiter would come under scrutiny, which would put her in a tricky legal position given the other accusations that had been leveled against Tate in the meantime. Remember, in Romania, until last month, the legal age of consent in Romania was 15, as we showed. It has since been raised to 16. But we'll remind viewers that the United States Extraterritorial Sexual Exploitation of Children statutes define a child as anyone under the age of 18. Although Vivian was not a statutory rape victim according to Romanian standards if they hooked up when she was 15 years old, she definably was under the US Criminal Code, which is something she may have not been aware of at the time. And since then, of course, she has participated in the recruiting and grooming of an unknown number of Tate's webcam girls, according to his own statement, where he has also said in other clips he was running 75 girls at the same time at four different locations. And if Cobra Baby had stepped up in 2016 when Tate was kicked off Big Brother and declared herself a victim, which she was, all of the other girls that followed her could have been spared. Being a victim does not excuse participating in victimizing the next girl that Tate lured in. Just in case there are any viewers furiously typing nonsense in the comments section about how any of this could possibly be taken out of context, here's some more context for you. Me and these two chicks, we start, we just start fucking hammering the webcam game. The women who were on stream were beautiful, but they didn't have a fucking clue what to say. So I'm trying to teach these women and the women kept fucking it up. So I said to, said to them, it's like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm taking over. So what I did is I unplugged their keyboards and plugged a new one in from me behind the screen. So the chicks would sit there and hit a, a keyboard that wasn't plugged in. And me and my brother and eventually some staff I trained would do all the talking. The girls were just pure, just famosers just laughing and doing this, their titties out, and they were talking to fucking ice cold hustlers. We were taking their money, all of it. And they, they come and say, <laughs> what kind of, all of it. We were fucking milking them dry. Women haven't got a clue how to famoose a dude. They don't have, because they rely on their looks. They don't have any of the intellect. They have no game. <laughs> nah. You get a man with game and give him a female's body, a female avatar, we he will fuck a guy up. I had these guys selling their houses, life savings, loans, all of it to me. Give me it all. You never you guy. feel bad or no? Fuck no. To give a solitary fuck. If you come and you enjoyed it and spoke to the girl and spent what you could afford to spend, cool. If you turned up and you're an idiot and got a loan out, is that my problem? No. So. I'm famoosing these dudes, right? So the guy would be like, what kind, of, what kind of guys do you like? And if he was a young man, I'd say, I can't believe I'm talking to some young guy. All these old creeps are on here. Oh my God, you're so handsome. Why that's, are you even here? So if he was an old guy, I would say, oh my God, I'm finally glad to talk to you. All these young creeps keep coming and talk to me. I want a guy who's serious, who's ready to settle down. Oh. I know older men will settle down. Da -da. Sell the dream, sell the dream, sell the dream. We got to the point where we had these guys falling in love with my models, serious, big time in love, right? Because they were like, can we meet? I've sent you $200,000. Can we meet? Can we meet? Can oh, we meet? 200. And and the problem is what was is, the most that one person sent to a model total million? Wow, wow. About a mil in about a year. I know you don't feel bad at all. Why the fuck would I? Yeah, care? I don't feel bad either. That confirms what Tate said in the previous video, but he continues on. Here's the degree to which Tate and his on-screen sirens milked their Johns dry without remorse. So what the girls would do is they promise meetings. And here's, maybe this is a bit bad. Here's where the famous would start. Cause they'd get some guy, fall in love, that they'd arrange today to meet. Ah, I need a visa. Okay, get a visa. I need money for a visa. Okay, how much is a visa? It's $900. Oh no, but it's not $900. Cause I went to the embassy. They think I'm a, a risk and I need a, a return flight there and back. And I need a hotel. I need to have spending money in my bank account. They won't let me come. Or how much you need? All right, 10 grand. Boom, it's 10 Gs. Boom. Okay, thanks. Wow. They rejected my visa. They said we have to wait two weeks. After two weeks, they'll give it to me. Okay, baby, boom. Two more weeks of tips. Boom, 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 boom. Because now he thinks he's gonna fuck, right? He thinks we get the girls. Now he's spending more than ever. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. Two weeks come. Some other problem. 
whether it's Visa, whatever, whatever. We'd make up some bullshit, right? All just, these OnlyFans chicks can learn from you, man. Oh, no, man, no, no but you know, like, like a free, people, people, people watch free people, OnlyFans tutorial. Yeah, here people, in the, in the people, people, people would say, why did those girls work for you? Because the girls would work for me. And at 50%, because it was 50-50, would make millions per month. If they worked for themselves, they'd make fucking nothing. I was the best in the fucking game. You could have double dipped and started a coaching to coach these guys too, right? I, I could have, but fuck, I'll give it all for free because I'm rich already. So the girl would be online for six or seven hours, but then when she logged off, was sleeping or whatever, on her WhatsApp, I'd have staff. She was online 24 hours a day. Her WhatsApp, her this. She was famousing when she was asleep. We were bringing money from the fucking sky. We were promising all these meetings, all these pictures outside of embassies, all this shit. Eventually, the girl, what she would do is she'd say, oh, I don't want to go embassy. She'd give a really lame excuse to try and provoke the man to get angry. So she'd say, the embassy want me to come back, but I have a headache. That was the one we'd use. <laughs> he'd be like, I just sent you a million dollars. You promised you were going to come. You said you had to delay. Now you're saying you have a fucking headache and you won't go to your appointment to make him mad on purpose because that would annoy any man. That's what we needed. We need the little trigger. And we go, why are you being aggressive? I'm not being aggressive, but you're not serious. Da, da, da. And then we'd say, but you know what? I, I really like you and I'm flying to the other side of the world by myself. And now you're being aggressive and now I'm intimidated. And we'd flip it on him saying, well, now you're being scary. No, I'm not being scary, but you, you know, it's your appointment. You're supposed to go, yeah, but I feel sick and you don't even care. Female bullshit, poking him to the point where you go like, you're a fucking scammer. You fucking scam me. Get really mad. I can't believe you think I was a scammer. I was going to come. I went to the embassy. You're a fucking liar. Every man in my life has only lied to me. I thought you were different. Da, da, da. Big, big beef, big Very argument, yep. big argument. But here's the thing. The guy would get pissed off, right? And leave, stop tipping her, stop coming to her. But for these men, that's the only chick in the world. The only hot chick in the world who talks to him. Maybe it takes a week, maybe it takes two weeks, maybe it takes three weeks. He's in bed at night, alone, jerking off, looking at her old videos and pictures, watching her stream again from another account so she can't see it's him, sitting there going, maybe she was going to come. Maybe I just got too mad yeah, when she had you. a headache. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I should have been a little bit more patient and she would have been my girlfriend. And 100% of the time, in less than three months, with an apology, a brand new pile of money, and the cycle would repeat. We fucking killed the game. Millions of dollars a week. And it was not just because I had beautiful girls. It's not because webcam is easy. It's because I am a genius. And I put together an apparatus of genius behind the avatar of beauty. And we fucking <laughs> conquered the internet. Now, what's even worse is that the PhD program evolved into another web enterprise called Hustlers University, where these same Arrested Development men children can learn directly from Tate what it takes to become a self-obsessed poser misogynist just like him. And it would appear they're still trying to avoid taxes because Hustlers University now accepts Bitcoin. Under the column of hard to keep up with the taste, Hustlers University is now being branded on some other platforms as the real world, which plays on Tate's recent adoption of the Matrix as being the paradigm for his life, where agents of the Matrix are collectively plotting his downfall before he is able to inform the entire world about what he calls the truth. It's more mind games that seem to be just clever enough to trick his mindless followers, known as tater tots, into believing that the brothers are targets of international overlords that will do anything to prevent that truth from coming out. Then, going one step further, if that's even possible, now Tate has his own secret society known as the War Room. This organization that you pay $8,000 to join so you can chat on a Discord server with other people that paid $8,000 to join is supposedly how Tate has managed to acquire influence, access channels of corruption, and obtain passports to myriad countries of which he is not a citizen. Something he brags about quite openly. So, for example, I have seven passports. I have 15 driver's licenses. So let's say I'm driving uh, my car and the police stop me. I'll just pull out a license from some random country. I'm in Romania. I'm driving a Slovakian plated car. I've got an American driver's license. I've got a Estonian passport and I'm speaking English. Like, you think they're going to take my license or they're just going to look at me and go, just slow down, bro, bye. If the paperwork's not worth it for them. One of the known disciples of the Tate School of Human Sex Trafficking and member of Tate's War Room is Vlad Obu who is also currently under house arrest for the human trafficking crimes that he committed. 
also known as Vlad Obizic, Joe Lampton, and Mr. Lottahose. Prisoner number TBD is another martial arts fighter and video chatter charged with sexual crimes including sexual exploitation and using violence to force women to produce explicit pornographic content. This piece of human filth thought it would be clever to post a video on TikTok showing the bruises he gave his girlfriend across the back of her arms and legs. He honestly believed in the war room that was a flex. As with the Tates, this criminal used the lover boy method to attract his victims, promising marriage or relationships before forcing these young girls into online porn. The lover boy method is something we're going to dig into deeper shortly. This particular trafficker forced his victims to get tattoos of his face on them as proof of ownership. The Tates would never mark up their girls with tacky face tattoos. Using their signature to brand them for life, on the other hand, that seems to be more their trademark. Show the camera your tattoo. What does it say? Tate. Why does it say Tate? Because I'm his whore. You are my whore. Something we found interesting about Vlad is that he claims Andrew and Tristan Tate were the inspiration behind his criminal enterprise, but he also claims to have no business connections with them, as can be demonstrated in this photo of him sat next to Andrew Tate in the VIP section of this tacky neon nightclub. Our question would be, if Obizic has no involvement in, or knowledge of, the Tate organization, why is he being called as a witness for the prosecution in their criminal proceedings? One of the main reasons that people like Mr. Lottahoes try to mimic Tate is because the Tate brothers have been very successful convincing everyone that they have obtained unlimited wealth. The non-stop media coverage and his podcast appearances prior to his arrest show Tate living the high life, sailing on yachts surrounded by women, smoking his cigars on private jets, or driving exotic vehicles, as one might expect from a high net worth individual. Here's the thing though, Tate doesn't actually own any of those things. In August of 2022, Tate was in Croatia, seen loading his entourage and paid companionship onto a $100 million yacht sailing out of Split called Freedom. His minions, like this YouTube channel Bape Camp, reported that Tate had bought this yacht after being cancelled. But that's not the case at all. Tate has never had $100 million to throw at a boat. The videos he put out of that trip certainly show him enjoying himself, riding the jet skis, cuddling up to hookers, eating well and drinking top shelf, but the 48 meter yacht Freedom is actually owned by a group called Goulettes who recently refurbished the ship from bow to stern as you can see in their promotional video tour so they could charter the craft for 100 to 130,000 euros per week in the high season. Freedom has 11 bedrooms providing accommodation for up to 22 guests. So if you split that tally equally between 22 guests and add food and drink on top, you're looking at about five to seven thousand dollars per person, confirmed at the end of the video. This particular yacht starts at 100,000 euros for a basic charter package, food and beverage are extra, and you're looking at about five to $7,000 per person for the week. So if everyone paid their own way on this trip, Andrew Tate was able to convince his simple-minded fans he bought a $100 million yacht by chartering this yacht that cost him as little as $5,000, then videotaping every second of their cruise for unlimited use in future videos. Next up is the jet that he loves to have his picture taken in. Of course, he has to charter that too because Andrew Tate doesn't own a private jet. Apparently, he did own one for about four months before flipping it. The guess would be that was just after he found out how much it cost to staff the plane, fly the plane, fuel the plane, maintain the plane, and hangar the plane. So when you see him lounging in these luxurious leather seats with his anime girlfriends attending to him, just remember this image is as based in reality as a bride getting liquored up in a limo for her stag up party, then pretending she owns the limousine. When Tate is lighting up the cigar that he always seems to have hanging out of his mouth these days, that is not his own plane that he's stinking up. Which brings us to an aside which we find humorous. Andrew Tate, who wants you to think he is completely refined, doesn't know how to light a cigar properly. Seriously. The tobacco in fine cigars gets brutalized when it's lit with a chemical fire, whether it's a match or a gas lighter. The term used by cigar aficionados is bruising the tobacco, a cardinal sin. The proper way to light a cigar, such that chemicals don't taint the tobacco, is either with a long sulfurless match on a cedar stick, or with what's called a cedar spill, which you light with a match or lighter, allow to burn for a couple of seconds to get rid of the chemicals, and then use that to light the cigar. 
Many cigars that come in their own sealed tubes have a cedar strip included inside, which most people mistakenly believe is there to moderate the humidity inside the seal, when it is actually the best way to enjoy the untainted flavor and aroma of fine tobacco. The more you know. What's next? Oh yeah, his car collection. The one he was bragging about to Greta Thunberg. Yeah, the teenager that likes yelling at people on TV. How dare you! If you missed this exchange, let's keep it short and sweet. December last year, Andrew Tate decided he was going to take the piss out of the teenaged activist by tweeting, Hello at Greta Thunberg, I have 33 cars. My Bugatti has a W16 8 liter quad turbo. My two Ferrari 812 Competizions have 6.5 liter V12s. This is just the start. Please provide your email address so I can send a complete list of my car collection and the respective enormous emissions. Her response is actually quite clever. Yes, please do enlighten me. Email me at smalldickenergy at getalife.com, one of the most viewed tweets in history. To which, Tate felt the need to release this video to again go after the perpetually angry 19-year-old child. It's Tate, in his best leisure suit Larry smoking blouse, kicking back enjoying pizza delivered from a local shop called Jerry's. The unique boxes with the shop's name and Romanian dialect, along with their website address, which Tate told his off-screen attendant to specifically not recycle to egg on Thunberg, contained enough information to give even the most casual viewer a reasonable idea where Tate could be located at that time. As it turned out, the Romanian authorities had been investigating Tate and his brother Tristan since the previous April and were looking for confirmation that he was in fact in the country. The day following the video release, Romanian law enforcement stormed Tate's Bucharest compound and hauled away Andy, his apprentice, and two female accomplices. That's one way to get a smile out of Greta. Some reports like this one state that the pizza box information led directly to the arrest of the Tates. The Romanian authorities reported that the pizza box did not lead them to where the Tates were holed up. The timing was funny, but pure coincidence. However, the fact is, the very next day is when Tate and his accomplices were arrested on rape and sex trafficking charges. And let's be honest here, if you were the lead investigator looking into Tate for months, had no leads on his whereabouts, no arrest on the charges, and you wound up getting clued into their location through a Twitter war with a teenager featuring a local pizza box, are you seriously going to tell people that's how you crack the case? Probably not. But the best part of this story is that the cars Tate was bragging about, like the Bugatti Tate was fueling up in his initial post to taunt Thunberg, he doesn't own it. He doesn't own any of the cars that he liked to flash photos of. You need proof? How about hearing it from him directly? I don't own anything. I've heard you say that a few so can times. You yeah, that? Can, you yeah. can you explain that? Can you enlighten that? that? You own nothing, I don't, I don't own anything. I'm, I'm, I'm just some dude. I think you have her. a Bugatti though, don't you? Yeah, when you say nothing, do you mean Do you not nothing? own it? Nothing. Okay, that's I don't good. Own, I don't own anything. There yeah. are there are cars. Let's say there's a that you have access to. Correct. <laughs> a, a trust in Singapore may own a percentage of a company in Dubai, which may have access to a car that I could borrow mm. on a social media influence contract, perhaps. Yeah. But I don't own anything, and that's because if you own things, they come for you. And now he really doesn't own any of them, since every vehicle Tate bragged about was impounded and hauled away as proceeds of his ongoing criminal enterprise while he awaits trial. Odds are very good, he will never see those cars again. Also, it was 15 cars, Tate. There were 15 cars they took that were worth anything. But they left you the Lada, which will likely outlast all the other whips anyway. Unfortunately for those cars, they'll carry a stigma from here on in when they get auctioned off by the Romanian government, instead of having a higher intrinsic value for being the car driven by a former kickboxing champion social media influencer, now will be referred to as the daily driver of a convicted international sex trafficking rapist. Doesn't quite carry the same appeal, but maybe they can sell the cars for parts. And since we're here already, watching the cars get towed right out of his driveway, let's take a look at the infamous Tate compound, which some refer to as his mansion, when it's actually a renovated warehouse at the end of a dead-end street in a rundown end of town across the swamp from the airport. Mosquitoes there must be a lot of fun in the summertime. Another handy neighborhood amenity is the local graveyard, about two blocks away, that you have to pass every time you visit the incarcerated Tates. The walled compound you're used to seeing in every Tate video of late is much smaller than you'd think, owing in large part to the camera angles that the videos are shot in. The compound lot itself measures roughly 110 feet deep by 230 feet of footage, where the length of the property is right on the road. Total square footage of the walled compound is around 23,600 square feet, half an acre, just under a quarter hectare. 
Adjacent to this lot is another overgrown lot, which might be part of the property, or it might be another lot that hasn't been built on yet. Either way, it's overgrown and it looks like shit. The largest building, the black one with the red neon entrance, measures about 60 feet by 120 feet, so a footprint of under 7,100 square feet, about 650 square meters. Not exactly what people think of when they think mansion. And judging from their decor choices, they tried really hard to single-handedly make black paint dye a rare commodity in Romania. Most of the walls in most of the rooms, especially on the main level, are dark as caves, with red neon strips to give the whole place a feeling somewhere between a strip club and a Bond villain lair. According to multiple sources and news reports, the walled compound that Tate and his sidekick were holed up in was only worth between $600,000 and $700,000, described by the Guardian as being less Hollywood hideaway and more rundown meat factory. Yet, according to other sites, like this one, the Tates reportedly spent $30 million on renovating this compound. And this is either complete bullshit, or these two idiots are the stupidest landowners in Romania. Because you know what they could have bought for less than $30 million US in Bucharest? Here's a couple examples. They could have bought this 78-room hotel in Mataya Mio for $3.8 million US, or the 14,000 square meter, 166 room Hotel Central in Playas de Republici for $6.5 million. Those are just two of the multi-room commercial options available in the area. One of the most expensive residential properties is this one located at number 9 Tudor Argizi Street in Bucharest, the Maurice Blanc Palace. The 50 room mansion alone is significantly larger than the lot the Tates own. And since they love walled compounds so much, this pick would have been perfect for them, as it was the former home of the U.S. Embassy for 70 years and is surrounded by high spiked fences. Price on this property is under 5 million U.S. So if these two morons actually spent 30 million dollars on renovating a beat up warehouse in the deserted swampy end of town into the black neon dungeon they're currently forced to occupy, they truly are some of the dumbest criminals in Romania. And that's saying something. So obviously we're going to have a lot of Tate fanboys crying in the comment section, declaring that Tate is incredibly wealthy and therefore all of this information must be faked. To which we would agree. You're goddamn right. That those facts don't line up. But it's not the facts that are being faked. As with everything else we went through, the actual wealth of the Tate brothers has been grossly exaggerated. And one of the first clues that these net worth numbers are being pulled out of thin air is that every article you'll read uses a different number. You can find people reporting that Tate is worth 100 million or 200 million or 365 million. Pick a number between one and a billion, add Tate to the search and you'll probably find it. A common one recently is 700 million plus. Tate has laughably referred to himself as a trillionaire, which is a completely different strata of wealth from millionaire, one so rare that no individual has achieved it. Not Musk, not Bezos, and not Gates. So Tate's had to tone it down somewhat, recently declaring that he became a billionaire instead. But again, there's no truth to this. So what is the right number for the net worth of Andrew Tate, with or without his brother Tristan? Apparently that number is 10. 10 million dollars. 10 million pounds. Combined. And here's where that number comes from. Romanian authorities that seized the assets of the Tate brothers and tallied it all up. And this is what they came up with. We already know that the Romanian authorities seized the Tate's exotic car collection, and we watched those getting towed away. Up for debate is whether or not the Bugatti was included in that seizure, but that really doesn't factor in, because as Tate said himself, he doesn't own that car. Dacot also seized 440,000 pounds in Bitcoin. For someone who has long claimed that he's a big shot in the crypto space, even selling his related expertise on his subscription website, the Tates only held about 20 Bitcoin between them. The watches they used to brag about were also seized. The one pictured here, matching the Bugatti that Tate doesn't own, had a ridiculous $300,000 retail value on it. Then there's 84,000 pounds in investments, about 120,000 US, and 15 properties worth a collective 2 million pounds. And this probably includes the casino locations that they franchised from the mob. Tally it all up and the brothers are worth maybe 5 mil apiece. Not bad for former brokies, but certainly not an empire worth bragging about. Or selling tickets to get into. Especially now that they stand to lose it all through their upcoming trials. 
But since we're over an hour into this episode already, we're going to stop here and pick it up again in a finale, starting with the multiple legal battles the Tates are facing, who their accomplices were, and we'll introduce you to the star witnesses against the Tates in our finale of Andrew Tate, Matrix of Lies. Hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so that you'll know when the Common Sense Skeptic returns.